Hi, I'm Dr. Lori, and this is Questions and Answers. So your questions, my answers. I'm going to talk about art, antiques, and collectibles, whatever questions that you have from my social media pages, on, on our website, wherever. And I'm happy to field your questions. I'll give you my opinions, too. Um, I always start by telling you about the bowl. So the questions are in the bowl. And this is the bowl. This particular bowl is made by a Pennsylvania uh, ceramic artist named Ron Hand. Uh, the bowl, he's very well known for American Chino glazes and Chino pottery. This particular bowl dates from the late 1980s, early 1990s. Value on it about $250. So let's get started. Here's the first question. First question. Hi, Dr. Lori. I love your videos. Well, thank you. Can you please tell me the best way to sell loose gemstones? I have a lot of precious gemstones, semi-precious stones. They're fasted. I want to sell them. I don't know what to do. I respect you a lot. Thanks in advance. Okay. So you're selling gemstones. It's just like selling anything else. It's not that it's difficult particularly, but you have a different type of thing. So whether your gemstones are in actual jewelry, right, in a bracelet and earrings and necklace, whatever it might be, or if your gemstones are loose, if your gemstones are loose, then a couple of suggestions. First of all, you need an appraisal of your gemstones, right? You need an identification of those gemstones. So you need to know, are they faceted? How, what's the carat weight? How color are they? What type of stone are they? Are you dealing with, you know, chalcedony? Are you dealing with amethyst? Are they real diamonds? Are they colorless? What's the, all of that stuff is important. So that's one of the things you have to do. The appraisal is important for gemstones. Then you can think, okay, well, could I sell it back to the jeweler who I bought it from? One option. Can I sell it on, on online at an auction? Can I sell it at a traditional auction? You could do that. You could sell it through consignment. There are some places that only sell through consignment for gemstones. You could also ask the jeweler that you bought it from if they'll buy it back. You could also try to trade it. So there are lots of ways to do it. You know, is there one particular um, best place to sell your gemstones? It's the same thing about any other type of fine or costume jewelry. So think about that. So when it comes to it, you can trade it, you can auction it, you can try to resell it. And then there are other businesses who are selling these pieces. You might contact them and say, hey, do you also purchase pieces too? Um, whether it's fine jewelry or just the loose gemstones as well. So I hope some of those options um, help you. I always think you're going to bring the most money home if you work within the online environment because you open it up to a very broad market. I like selling online. I think that's a good way for people to sell anything, including, less, including loose gemstones. Okay, let's see what other questions we got. <clears throat> If the value of an item changes, if the value of an antique item changes after a few years, okay, it would change after a few years. You can't expect that your antique is always going to be worth the same amount, right? Okay. Is it advisable to ask for a new appraisal? How many years is it prudent to make a repeat appraisal of value? Okay. Insurance appraisals should be updated every three to five years, usually every three years. And appraisals for fair market value should be updated more frequently than that, anywhere between one year and three years. So now you go, oh, wow, I have to have appraisals all the time. If you want to know the fair market value, right, retail value, fair market value, what the market is actually paying for certain things, you have to keep up on it. So when I say I have to keep up on the values, I have to always be looking at these values, researching these values, and seeing where things have sold, right? And how much they've sold for. So it's a constant research project for appraisers like me at this level to basically always know what these things are worth. Insurance appraisals, about every three years. So if you have an insurance piece, a piece that you've insured, and then you had an appraisal on it, and they said it's worth $10,000, and you pay the premium for those three years, all of a sudden the piece goes up in value or down in value, but you're still paying this premium, you want to make sure it's updated. Because if something happens, pipe bursts, there's a fire, and there's some loss, and you want to make a claim, you want to have an accurate current appraisal. And the insurance companies always want an accurate current appraisal as well, showing sales records to prove it. Because if they have to pay out a claim, you have to have the appraised value that is current. Otherwise, they're saying, well, this appraisal is too old and we can't honor it. Those things happen. So for insurance appraisals, about every three years. And then for fair market appraisals, it's going to be you know, relatively short amount of time because you want to be active in the market and know what's happening. Remember, markets fluctuate just like anything else. So especially with the art and antique and collectibles market. 
Thanks for that question. Next question. Dr. Lori, is almost everything signed or stamped? Well, you know, a lot of things are signed and stamped, right? A lot of people like signatures. They prefer signatures. They think because it's signed, it's going to be really valuable and important. You know, I am not a big advocate of everything has to be signed or stamped. The other thing about signatures is that they're easy to forge, right? Stamps, labels, um, these adhesive pieces, you know, markers are oftentimes easy to forge too. But labels really came into widespread use in the middle part of the 20th century. And a lot of people will look for those particular labels to identify their pieces if it's easier to just make a label than to actually inscribe into a piece. Um, a lot of high quality pieces are usually marked in a way where they are inscribed in or they're molded in or incised or embossed. So that's pretty typical. You see that with a lot of antiques that the pieces are marked in a certain way. So it's not just a label, um, you know, whatever pieces you might see in that way. So for example, let me put these on. I'll show you what I mean with something on the table. So if you have a piece that's marked, you're going to have an easier time of it uh, <clears throat> getting a, a good mark on it. Like, well, that's not a great mark. Let's see if this is a better mark. Oh, that's not a good mark either. Let's look at this mark. So this mark is a Glidden American pottery mark. Okay. So this is the mark that you would see if you had a piece of Glidden American pottery from the 1950s, like this one. And it says Glidden on it, and then it has another number on it. So that's going to be pretty helpful in identifying your piece. That's going to be pretty helpful for you to know what you have in terms of this. So um, the Glidden mark is one example. So if this were a piece of Glidden, uh, which it is, if you had a piece of Murano glass, for example, maybe you'd have a label on it. But it also oftentimes would say Murano too. So the last part of the question is about the Murano part. It says, is Murano glass stamped or etched and do fakes have stickers? It's not that fakes have stickers. It's not that the stickers are always fake. It's that in fact the stickers are used at a different time. So over time when you're looking at art or antiques, what you're going to find in fact are different marks at different times. So I want to think of like Hummel figurines. The Goebel company makes Hummel figurines. They have all different marks and those marks change over time. They change and they, when of course the history of Germany changed from marking it Germany to marking it West Germany, all of a sudden you had a different mark, right? So that helps you to date the pieces. So the marks can change. Murano can have, you know, the incised Murano. Um, Belique has multiple marks over multiple times. So you could be getting an authentic piece, but you recognize one mark and then you say, oh, is it a different mark? So not necessarily fakes. Now, does that mean it can't be faked? It can be faked, sure. So these pieces can be faked and marks can be faked and they're oftentimes faked. So you have to really learn which marks are authentic. This is why you need honest, accurate, expert appraisals. Not just people who go around shopping saying, oh, I'm going to show you what it's worth because that's what I sold it for. That's not an appraisal. An appraisal is an analysis of the market. It is not just anybody who sold something telling you that everything else like it is worth the same amount because it's not. So you want to think about this. This is analysis of the market. So yes, they can be faked. Not everything is signed. Signatures are not the holy grail. Quality is the holy grail. So be aware when you're looking at these particular pieces. But train yourself. Look for the marks. Look for what looks unusual to you. One of the things, for example, on paintings is, is the signature above the varnish or below the varnish? Oftentimes artists will paint a painting and then they will actually paint it and then they'll varnish on top of the painted image. The signature is usually under the varnish. If you see a signature over the varnish or on top of the varnish, that you can tell, like with a black light, for example, a lot of people like to look at black, use black lights. So if it's over the varnish, usually you have a forgery or you have somebody signing it after the fact. And I'll talk more about that when we talk about paintings. But all right, next question. <clears throat> so where do you see the signature on Lucite to find out if any of those, any of the designer names are attached to a piece? I only see this piece of Lucite where everything is clear. Some are signed and some are not. This goes on the same points. Funny that they pick it out of the bowl right after another. Um, you need to know the designer's style. So a lot of people will say this about Lucite, um, which is, of course, that clear, of course, um, furniture design pieces that you see of the 1950s and 60s, and also about glass. 
So when you're identifying glass and you don't see a signature, you can't find any mark, you have to learn it by the pattern, which is why a lot of people have a hard time identifying glass. It's because you have to learn the patterns, certain patterns made by certain companies. And certain companies make the same or similar patterns as other companies because they're popular. So a lot of these things are more difficult to identify. So you have to sort of start to learn about a style or a or a um, particular pattern. And this becomes harder. This is where you have to educate your eyeballs. This is where people say, oh, art historians. Well, we have to learn all the styles. So when we look at a piece, we're not only looking for signatures. You know, it takes a lot of time and a lot of effort and a lot of looking and a lot of comparing. And it's really to train yourself. You know, it's how I have to train myself to not eat, you know, the 15th, you know, potato chip. <laughs> you have to train yourself. So you have to do it a lot. And um, I also like to sort of teach you, I like to teach you how to look at a photograph online if you're selling it, an on, if you're buying at an online auction, as a lot of folks do, and then they resell from an online auction, to be able to know what the photograph should look like to identify whether or not it's, it's a real authentic piece or not. So you have to not only know how to recognize the style, but you have to know how to also recognize whether or not what that photograph is telling you if it's an online auction type of thing. So you want to look at all of those things. Not that easy, not that easy. Okay, let's see what's next. Hi, Dr. Lori. I took my daily trip today to, to the thrift store. There was a lady there with a flashlight and she flashed it on every object on a shelf. <laughs> okay, so this is an expert trying to figure something out. All right, okay. While she was doing that, I found a nice piece of Orphor's crystal from Sweden. It had a $90 label on it from a, a department store. I bought it for $6. I'm still curious to figure out what the lady was doing with the flashlight. Um, she, you're all looking for tricks. You know, there really isn't any trick. What she probably was trying to do um, is, in fact, she was trying to use a black light to identify if anything fluoresces. Because fluorescence can show you, in fact, cracks or chips, damage. Um, also, it can show you if there's some kind of material, some kind of liquid, something on top of something. You've seen those shows in hotels where they go in hotel rooms, they show you black light and you see how dirty everything was. You've seen that. Well, black light will also show you if something's been repaired, right? So if you have a painting and there's a big tear in it, if there's been a repair and if it's been overpainted, you could see that, you know. Um, Black light is pretty popular. Like here's an example of a black light. You know, I don't want to turn it on. It's basically going to, uh, it's going to, to have that, that bluish light color. Um, so it'll, it'll have pieces fluoresce for you. So that could tell, maybe she was doing that, but you said she was using a flashlight and you wanted to know what her trick was. So I don't know what her particular trick was. What's funny to me is she's going around on these shelves with a flashlight and you've got Aura Force, an Aura Force crystal vase for six bucks. So you got the real bargain at the thrift store while she's going around trying to look and identify these things using a regular flashlight. If she had a black light would show you, in fact, if it fluoresced, if something had been repaired or is damaged. And um, of course, a flashlight could actually put more light on um, a piece that might be cracked. So that might be more helpful for a piece of glass or a piece of crystal. But it sounds like you got the bargain on this particular outing to the thrift store. Um, the tricks, it's uh, not really a lot about tricks. It's a lot about getting the insider information here and learning from that insider information so you can identify these pieces and so you can recognize what you've got and what it's really worth. When you start to recognize quality on a consistent level, once you start recognizing quality that way, all of a sudden you're going to be able to go, okay, that's junk, okay, that's not. Now I'm going to teach you how to do it. All right, next question, let's see. Uh, how can you appraise and authenticate a painting without actually seeing it in person? I would prefer to see every single thing in person. It is not prudent to think that anybody could see everything in person in today's world. For the objects that everybody wants me to see, we have to do it through video. We have to do it through photographs. We have to do it that way. Okay. You teach about looking for points or clues, but I don't know how to do this. Well, of course you don't know how to do this, and you probably don't know a little bit about what a background is and with a PhD in art history and museum experience. In order for me to pass all those exams and do all those papers and all that hoops that you had to jump through to get the PhD, I had to sit in rooms, dark rooms, where they would flash images up of famous works of art. You know, they didn't take us to the Louvre and take us to the Uffizi and take us to the Met. 
what they did was they said, okay, here's the Mona Lisa. Okay, here's Jackson Pollock's autumn rhythm. Okay, here's a Greek pottery shard. Here's a this, here's a that on an image. And when I was going to school, I hate to admit it, they were slides. They weren't digital images on the internet. They were slides in a slide projector. And they'd show you the image. So that image had to be a very good photograph of that piece, either from a museum where it was their job to take good photographs for art historians to learn from. That's what museums did. And then basically we would see them on the wall. I have learned to train my eyes to look at these particular images, right? to identify pieces from photographs, right? So yes, I'd love it if we could bring everything to me and I could just see it, you know, sitting here on a perch looking at everything in person. Sure, that would be great. But because I have all that training, I'm able to do this through photographs. Now, you're saying, why can't I do it? Well, it takes training. I mean, you can do it if you wanna take the time, the energy, the effort, and have all the schooling to do it, you could do it. But basically, that's what you need. So you say, you don't know how I do this, but in order to do that, to pass those exams, I had to learn it from photographs because that was the only way we were going to become familiar with these particular works of art. So when I have an opportunity to go to that museum, to go to the Vatican, to do whatever, and see these great masterpieces, I would go. And I think many people would go. When you're traveling the, traveling the world, traveling countries, you're like, I wanna go to this museum. I wanna see this work of art. So that's what a lot of people do. It's a little bit more, e a little bit easier now because you are seeing pictures so much and you're seeing video so much now. You all have your cell phones, your smartphones, you're all taking pictures. Everybody's a videographer and a photographer. So you're getting more acquainted with what photographs of objects should look like, okay? So try to take good pictures and try to train yourself. And that's the best thing for you to do. And the more you look, the more you're going to learn. I always say you educate your eyeballs, you're going to educate them where the quality is high. So look at objects in museums, look at objects, whether it's in the thrift store or the, you know, an antique shop or wherever, and compare and try to do it visually. Your brain is a computer and your eyes are the way it gets there. So you have to think about, you know, using your brain as a computer. If you close your eyes and you think of these pieces and you try to identify and have that visual of that piece or this piece or that painting, or whatever, you're gonna remember it and your your eyes will be able, to, and your brain will be able to recall it and bring it back up. So try to do that, try to remember that and try to look at as many pieces as you can and compare them to similar pieces. But that's how I do it. I've done it that way because I've been trained that way. Hi, Dr. Lori, I, reach, I recently purchased a handbag at a yard sale. Uh, the asking price was 25, I got it for 20 because I asked for a discount. Good, always negotiate, ask politely, get a discount. I'm new to reselling, but I'm really happy with this purchase because I think I purchased a Louis Vuitton. Oh, okay. So you think you got a Louis Vuitton for $20 at a yard sale. All right. Um, you decided to sell it at auction on a major online resource. Okay, so you don't say who. Uh, I set a seven-day auction starting at $100 with an opening bid and a buy it now option. So you've done this with the buying and selling. The buy it now option was $250 if somebody wanted to buy it then. Okay, buy it now. So you didn't know the value, but you put it up to bid and you didn't know the value. So that was your first mistake. You should have known what it was. You should have had it properly identified beforehand before you put it up to the auction, but you didn't. Okay. So um, we had the first bid, a hundred bucks. Then of course the bid started to get higher faster. And in the final hours, actually, um, the unexpected happened. You said the online service that you used pulled your item down saying it was a fake. So what do I do now? I'm contacting you because I don't think it's a fake. I looked online. I don't, can't tell the difference between the fakes and the real. Hmm, okay. And I want to know if you actually will do an appraisal. How much will it cost and can you do it? Well, here you go. This is why you need a correct identification to start. I would like to know why all of a sudden when you posted this piece on your auction, you were able to get the auction going. Then all of a sudden the service says, oh, it's fake. So did somebody who was looking at the auction say, oh, I think it's fake. They're putting up a fake and alert these people. Was it somebody who was thinking they had a different agenda? They're thinking, oh, I want to tell the online auction outline resource that in fact, you know, the hosting auction site that, oh, this is a fake. Um, and then thinking, oh, you'll say, oh, it's a fake. I didn't know it was a fake. I'm now going to sell it for 25 bucks or 35 bucks or at a lower price. 
You know, did they have that agenda? I don't understand why you're able to post it and list it and everybody's able to start bidding and then at the middle, of them, oh, it's a fake. So these are trolls. These are people who have some kind of agenda. There's something wrong here. Something is amiss. It doesn't make sense to me that you are allowed to put it up and then all of a sudden it's see, deemed as fake or, or fraudulent in some way. So I want you to be aware of that. I hope you still have the bag because we can, I, I can identify whether or not you have the real deal or not the real deal. And it's important. And there are people who will be able to identify this. So if you learn how to identify it, 20 bucks for a knockoff Louis Vuitton, you know, would be unusual, right? But 20 bucks for a real one would be very unusual. So we have to see whether or not you have it. Are they out there? Yes, they're out there. But the criteria you want to make sure that you're looking up online, you're saying, well, this person said you look for this and this person said you look for that. The source is very important and making sure that the source you have is is of course reputable is going to be important for you. So I hope you still have the bag. Sorry that happened to you. Yes, I can do the appraisal from photos. Hi, Dr. Lori. I got my husband's mother's wedding ring. She passed away. It's a beautiful gold and white gold ring with four diamonds. So it's yellow gold and white gold with four diamonds. We got it cleaned. It had all this crusty stuff on it. We didn't know. My husband got very emotional when he realized that my, his mother's ring was really something beautiful. We had it appraised. Good. And we're given paperwork that said it was worth $3,000. When my husband passed, I had the name engraved on the inside of the band. So she had her husband's name engraved on the inside of the band. Here's my question. Did I make a big goof having that done to the ring? Did I lose value in the ring by having his name engraved in the band? No, you didn't. You didn't do anything wrong in having his name engraved in the band. You know, it's a family heirloom. It's a piece that is, of course, um, of of sentimental value to your family. Hopefully you're gonna pass it down if you can. But no, you didn't do anything wrong. It's very common for wedding rings to be engraved. It's very common for wedding rings, in fact, to have a name or the date of the wedding inside, and then it gets handed down typically. That doesn't impact the value of the stones. It doesn't impact the value of the gold or the band. So that's fine. Um, the thing that you want to think about that's a little bit problematic is that now you have your husband's name in a ring that wasn't his wedding ring. So as it's handed down, you want to just make sure that you keep the family lineage information together, right? So keep it intact. So if you hand it down, tell the story that you had it, got it cleaned, and then you put your husband's name engraved in it. I think it's a nice keepsake. It will not negatively impact the value. But anytime you change or if you restored that piece or if you repaired that piece, if it was changed in any way other than just an engraving inside the band with a name, then it would impact value, sometimes positively, sometimes negatively. So those are your questions for this episode. I hope you learned some things. And if you have other questions, of course, you can put them in the comments. You can send them in to um, through, of course, my website, whatever you like, or through social media. I'm Dr. Lori. I hope you've enjoyed this episode, Questions and Answers. Thanks for watching.